with that, let's open back up to Luke chapter 9 this morning. We're going to be picking up in verse 37 and reading through verse 45. Luke 9, we're going to begin in verse 37. And as you're turning there, I want to open by looking back to a historical event. Um, On October 29th, 1941, Winston Churchill visited his old alma mater, uh, his school named Harrow School. And he had attended there from ages 13 to 18 before he was accepted into the Royal Military Academy. And of course, many years have passed since his time in either of those schools, and he's now, of course, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and the UK is in the throes of World War II. It's raging on the European front and beginning to inflame elsewhere. The Germans are sweeping across Europe, and they're flying bombing runs over England and the United Kingdom. Things are rough. The UK is engaged in the war on multiple fronts, and things are very difficult, to say the least. And so on this particular day, Churchill gives a short speech at his alma mater. He strengthened the resolve of the English people and speaking to this young generation. And a portion of the middle of the speech is what makes it memorable to this day. Against the backdrop of a, backdrop of a raging war and a season and time in which England and Britain had stood alone, Churchill said, this is the lesson. Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. And just a bit later to conclude his speech, he would say, do not let us speak of darker days. Let us speak rather of sterner days. These are not dark days. These are great days. The greatest days our country has ever lived, and we must all thank God that we have been allowed, each of us according to our stations, to play a part in making these days memorable in the history of our race. Wow. I love that. Never give in. Keep fighting. And these words spoken there with such power and such weight are actually just as meaningful in our personal lives today as they were in that national setting then. And the stakes may feel different between World War II and a national global setting in our own individual lives, but the need to persist and continue is just the same. The need to keep fighting is the same. And there's a lot happening in our text this morning, but one of the lessons that we can take away is the exhortation and the encouragement to keep fighting. And so with that, I want to dig in. We're going to pick up in verse 37, read through the text together and see how the Lord might speak to us. Luke 9, beginning in verse 37. Now what happened on the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, that a great multitude met him. Suddenly a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. But while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Let's pray together this morning. Father, thank you that your word is living, it's powerful, it's as meaningful as when the events were actually unfolding as it is today when we sit thousands of years removed from them. The lessons are just as applicable, just as meaningful, and just as alive today as they were when Jesus first spoke to his disciples. And so, Lord, help us hear Help us hear your living voice to us so that our lives can be changed as a result. Speak to us through your word, we pray, by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Now, just for context, if you remember, during our last study, Lucas led us through the transfiguration of Jesus. And really, what a, a powerful and beautiful moment that story holds for us. It's truly a mountaintop experience, literally and figuratively. But then comes the valley in the verses that we've read this morning. Jesus comes down the mountain into a mess and a multitude of people we read. And we read at the center of this turbulent mass of humanity are the remaining nine disciples and some scribes. The scribes are religious experts of the day. And Mark 9, which is a, a parallel passage of these, says that the disciples and the scribes were arguing when Jesus finds them. The word that Mark uses, it speaks of questioning, but it's a questioning that has obviously turned into an argument. They were picking and picking at the disciples, and now they're no longer questioning. They're just fighting with one another, just arguing. And so Jesus has to do the thing that every parent has to do about 100 times a day. What are you guys arguing about? What's going on here? What are you fighting about now? But instead of it being the disciples who answer, we see that the father of the demon-possessed child that we read of explains the situation. This man comes forward and he says, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only child. A man from the multitude, he comes out. Luke tells us that the father actually cries out to Jesus. You can hear just the desperation in his voice. Matthew, in his account of this story, expands on it, saying that the man came and fell at his knees before Jesus. The father is in a bad way, understandably. His son, his only child, is demon-possessed and severely tormented. And personally, when I read this story, immediately my mind thinks, how in the world did this happen? How did this come to be? How did this child come under the influence of a demonic spirit? And frustratingly, we're simply not told. We're not given any backstory. But one thing that the text makes abundantly clear is that spiritual warfare is a very real thing. And I don't want to spend all morning on this, but it's worth just acknowledging the obvious, shedding some light on what can be a confusing subject. And just two quick high points in brief. First, the demonic is real. There is a spiritual reality around us, both holy and unholy. We may not be able to perceive it with our five senses. We may not be able to understand it with our minds, but it is real nonetheless. Our lives are surrounded by an unseen spiritual reality, both holy and unholy. And secondly, though you and I as believers may encounter spiritual opposition, the demonic has no ability to control a believer's life. They can attack, they can tempt, but a believer cannot be possessed. And it's surprising how often this question comes up. Can a believer be possessed by a demon? And there's a certain amount of fear there. And I just want to just take this side note for a moment and just put those fears to rest. We can be tempted. We can be opposed. We can be attacked. But we're told that a believer can never be possessed. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 puts it like this. You are children, or rather, you are of God, little children. And have overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. When you and I are born again, God the Spirit indwells us. And he seals us. And there is no place for a, a second or third or fourth spirit within us. A believer may experience all sorts of opposition. But they can never be possessed. Now again, this is just two points among many in a whole wider conversation. But I felt it was worth just at least taking a moment to observe some of the obvious and one of the questions that comes up when we see something like this. And as the father continues, he's kneeling before Jesus and he says in verse 39, behold, a spirit seizes him and suddenly he cries out and it convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. Again, picture this man kneeling before Jesus in desperate petition. And the father begins to describe the, father, the son's condition. And it's a truly heart-wrenching scene, isn't it? 
We don't know how old the child was, but the word that the New Testament uses is child. It's the word to describe those who were two and under back in Matthew. It's the word to describe Jesus when he was 12 years old earlier in Luke. And so somewhere in that range between 12 and under is where that we find this young boy. And yet, we may not know exactly how old he is, but we don't really need to know exactly how old he is in order to feel the weight of this moment, to feel the depth of concern for a child in such a condition. And it tears at you to remember this is a real event. It's not a made-up story to prove a point or to illustrate a lesson. It's an actual father, and it's an actual son. And so the solution is obvious. Verse 40, I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. The father knew he needed to get his son to Jesus as he heard word of what Jesus was able to do. As word of Jesus' influence in the region was uh, passing around, he says, I need to get my son to this man. Now, we're not told where the family is from, but the father has located Jesus. Except that he hasn't, has he? Jesus is up on the mountaintop with three of his disciples at the moment. And so while Jesus is unavailable, the father went to Jesus' people. And this really isn't a bad idea. If you think back when Jesus had called his 12 to be apostles, he had conferred on them his authority to cast out demons. He had given them this privilege and this responsibility. And so taking the boy to the disciples, it wasn't a wrong move on his part. We see in this instance the disciples were unable to cast out the demon, and we can talk more about this later. But looking at this and looking at the Father, I love his heart here. He's very passionate about getting his son help, about freeing him from this thing that's destroying his life. He had gone to where he expected to find Jesus. And when Jesus wasn't there, he hadn't given up and just returned home. He asked the disciples to intervene. And he hadn't just asked them, he had implored them. He had asked with pleading. And when they couldn't help, he didn't hang his head in dejection and walk away. He stuck around. Maybe Jesus is coming back soon. Maybe when he gets back to the disciples, he'll be able to help. To state the obvious, this man cares deeply for his son. His heart is fully invested in seeing his son freed from this destructive influence. And it's not hard, again, for our hearts to go out to him, to be filled with the same bit of the fear and hope that mixed together in this dad's heart, the same bit of the helplessness that he must have felt that was also at the same time this threat of determination. We can sense what it was like to be in his shoes just for a moment. And a couple of points of application First, the father should have been filled with these emotions, right? It is the parent's job and place to look after the well-being of their children. He should have felt all of these emotions. They were absolutely the right response to his child's condition. And you might be thinking, well, no duh, no surprise there. If my kid were possessed by a demon and bent on self-destruction, I'd feel the same way. I'd be in the same condition as we should. But what about the other things seeking to destroy our kids? What about the other things seeking to destroy our kids? Now, it may not be a demon driving our children into the fire, but there is certainly a demonic course to this world trying to sweep them to de- as just a real a destruction. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. You once walked according to the course of this world, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Paul is describing a course that exists within this world that is set by Satan. And there's a very real battle for the hearts and minds and ultimately the souls of our kids. Satan is not at all passive about your kids or mine. And that means we can't afford to be either. You and I need to realize, parents, if you're still in that child-wearing age, that we're in a race to fill up the hearts and minds of our kids before this world does. 
We are in a battle against an enemy who wants to destroy our kids just as certainly as this son was uh, meant for destruction in the story. And so parents, let's not be passive about our children, hoping that they'll just turn all out all right if, you know, we give them enough space. Let's be passionate and diligent about getting our kids to Jesus. The same passion and diligence this father demonstrated here in our chapter. But secondly, what about ourselves? Because the same enemy who wants to destroy our children is opposed to us as well. We haven't aged out of the battle. He hasn't said, okay, they're too old, I'll just let them do. I'll just let them be. In John 10, verse 10, Jesus said that Satan's goal is to steal, to kill, and destroy at any age and at any opportunity. And to do this, Satan's most effective tactic from the Garden of Eden forward is to get us to destroy ourselves through sin. Think back to the Garden. Did he have permission and freedom to attack Eve and Adam alone? No, he didn't. But he knew a way that he could just as effectively destroy their lives and kill them, get them to sin. And that same tactic, that same if-then scenario lives in our lives. Satan can't do anything against us directly unless it's within the will of God. You can read the book of Job all about this. So he does the next best thing, and that is he gets us to destroy ourselves. He tempts and leads us towards sin. And with that in mind, if that's Satan's tool in our lives, let's not fool us that the sin in our lives is just some small little thing with small little consequences. You and I need to have the same care and concern for our souls that this father had for his son in a terribly, a terrible way. It would have been insane and it would have been dangerous. And likewise, with the sin that kills us, right? We can't just say, it's just a little sin. Oh, it's just a, a little unforgiveness that I hold. It's just a little bit of lie. It's just a little bit of, and then fill in the blank with our sin, the thing that affects us. Our sin kills and destroys just as certainly as the demon who possessed this boy. And I'm not gonna spend all morning building this thought out too far. And if you're not convinced, and if you don't believe it, then just look at the effects of sin in your own life. Just look over your own history. The proof is there. Sin brings death, just like the Bible says. And so let's do as this father did, and run to Jesus. Run to him. Let's join in the fight and say, Jesus, cast this sin out of my life. Get this thing out of here. I don't want it to define who I am. I don't want it to mark me any longer. What do we need to do? Just like this, Father, what do we need to do to cast sin out? Jesus said our response to sin should be so strong and so determined that we'd be willing to cut off a hand or pluck out an eye if it would mean that we'd be free from sin. Our problem, or at least my problem, is I I want the battle against sin to be easy and convenient. I want to just wake up holy. And it doesn't quite work like that. It's a battle for a reason. It's not just a snooze. It's a battle. Well, when Jesus hears the heart of this father, he interestingly answers in verse 41 saying, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you, bring your son here. And this is an interesting and unexpected response, isn't it? This doesn't feel like the compassion that we'd expect our Savior to show in this moment. And yet, as we'll see, there truly is merit to his rebuke. In a bit, we're going to see that it seems the disciples have quit praying for this man's son. Their faith has failed. We also see here at the scribes, who are the religious experts in the day and should have been able to contribute in a healthy way to this setting, they weren't helping at all. They were only nitpicking and arguing. And these two groups, the disciples and the scribes, were just small samples of what was happening in the nation as a whole. Because in Luke 19, Jesus will grieve over the entire nation, saying that they had missed the signs and the timing of his arrival. The generation present in Jesus' day missed him entirely. And gang, what a warning 
for us. If we think Jesus would say anything else to describe our generation and our day, we are sadly mistaken. We are confused. And so let's not snicker and point our fingers at these guys as if we didn't have a log in our own eye. Jesus grieves over the lack of faith he finds in this moment. And he asks, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? There's really two questions here. It's a two-part question. He wouldn't be with them too much longer. In verse 44, he's going to talk about how his life will end and how his time on earth will conclude. He won't be with them for very much longer, but he will continue to bear with his people throughout eternity. His people might give up on him and show surprisingly little faith in him, but he will never give up on his people. Even today, when the fighting in Israel is filling our news headlines, it's good to remember that God is still for his people. He is not done with Israel as a nation. And this is repeated all over the Old Testament. For instance, in Jeremiah 33, we read, and you could read the whole chapter. It's a wonderful chapter of God's faithfulness to the nation. He says, thus says the Lord, If my covenant is not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then I will cast away the descendants of Jacob and David my servant, so that I will not take any of his descendants to be ruler over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will cause their captives to return and will have mercy on them. God is saying that his commitment to Israel is more sure than the pattern of day and night. There's a better chance that day and night will cease than God giving up on his people and his promises to to them. And gang, this isn't just an Old Testament idea. In Romans 11, Paul asked with passion in his voice, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. And we'll just say it plainly. God is not done with the nation of Israel. He continues to bear with them. He has not replaced them with the church or any other group. The descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still his people still the recipients of all his promises to them, and he has a plan for them. Now, it's not the point of the text this morning to discuss at length God's promises to Israel and his plans for them, but in light of Jesus' question and our current events, it's worth remembering what the Bible says. God's covenant with Israel will never be broken. He will bear with them through to the end of his plans for this world, just like he bears with us. Gang, it is good news that God won't break his promise to Israel because if he will break and change his covenant with them, what certainty do we have with his promises to us? They and you are loved by a God who does not break his word. When he makes a covenant, he keeps it to Israel and to us. His compassions do not fail And that's certainly the case here in our text. The situation surrounding the disciples may have saddened Jesus when he came down from the mountain, but his care for his people doesn't stop. And so even though he grieves over the lack of faith he finds, he instructs the father to bring his son over, and he's going to heal and deliver him. And in verse 42, we read that as he, that is the child was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. And then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and gave him back to his father. At this point, I want you to grab your Bible and turn over to Mark chapter 9. Mark's account actually gives us a few more details than Luke. Mark chapter 9, and when you get there, skip down to about verse 20. We're picking up right where we left off. Mark 9 verse 20 Then they brought him, that it is, the child to Jesus. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. 
So Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And there is a lot here, isn't there? This exchange tears at me every time I read it. The child is led to Jesus and the demon begins to torment him again. It's violent. It's humiliating. It's scary. It's a situation that has had his parents feeling helpless and unarmed, disarmed for years. They've been unable to help their child in any way, shape, or form. And it seems that this has been happening at regular intervals since early childhood. It's unbelievable. It's heartbreaking when you consider it. And so the father, understandably, he pleads with Jesus again, please, if you are able to help us, help our son, have compassion on us. And then Jesus responds with, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Wow. Now, on the one hand, this is amazing because Jesus is saying the sky's the limit for what he can do in our lives. If we trust him, he can do anything according to his good will and plans. There is nothing short that he cannot do. On the other hand, this seems to put pressure on the father's faith for the healing of his son, doesn't it? And it seems that that's how the father interprets and hears Jesus' statement because immediately the father cries out and says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. The father is completely torn here. He believes. I mean, that's why he brought his son to find Jesus. That's why he brought him in the first case, because he believed there was help for his son. But if he's honest, he knows that he still has doubts. Did he really believe that Jesus could change something that had defied every other attempt to help his son? Could this year's long torment really come to an end or was it just too much to overcome? Did he, as the father, have enough faith or was there too much doubt living in his heart? Have you ever felt this way as you follow God? Lord, do I have enough faith or is there just too much doubt inside of me to allow you to do what you want to do? Maybe you think, maybe I'm not good enough. If I, if I was just a little bit better at life, at this Christian thing, then God could really move, but it's probably me. I'm probably the problem here. Maybe I don't believe enough. I know I've struggled with thoughts like these. They fill us all, I would imagine, and you're certainly not alone. And though this could be a subject for much larger conversation, here's the good news. When you and I place our faith in Jesus, all his perfection is attributed to our account. His perfection is applied and laid over our lives. Just a few verses earlier in the chapter, the Father, speaking at that Mount of Transfiguration, called Jesus his beloved Son, and we are hidden in Christ. And so you and I no longer have to wonder, am I good enough? Because no, you're not. But Jesus is, right? That is the exchange that happens at salvation. All of my failures, all of my brokenness set aside, placed on Jesus' shoulders so that he can give me all his perfection. When the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, he can now speak that over our lives, not because our track record is so perfect, but because Jesus is is we're hidden in him god knows our brokenness he knows our lack of goodness and he covers us through his son and regarding our faith what did jesus say 
In Matthew 17, he said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. How much faith does Jesus demand in order to be able to move in our lives? Just the size of a mustard seed. Imagine you had a Sharpie pin in your hand right now, and you took it and you just made a dot on your paper. That's the size of a mustard seed. They're tiny, and that's the point of the story, isn't it? Jesus isn't saying you need a watermelon. That's the size of faith that you need. You need a shopping cart full. He says, no, he picks this tiny little thing, a mustard seed. With even a tiny amount of faith, even a sliver within our hearts, Jesus is able to respond to us in prayer. And that's what we see with this father and his son. Despite the father's struggle of faith, Jesus is able to act, isn't he? Even though the father's faith faith is mixed through with doubt and fear, he still has that sliver, a mustard seed of faith, and Jesus moves the mountain that has been overwhelming this family for years. Our text says that Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to the father. If we continue in here in Mark 9, we read that Jesus actually reached down to lift the boy up by his hand. He reached down and lifted the little boy up from the ground. Isn't that the infinite heart of God demonstrated in the simplest and smallest of acts? He reaches down to the weak, dirty, tormented, powerless child and lifts him up. He doesn't retreat from the boy and think, oh, I can't get involved with that. He reaches out and he picks him up. And that's the gospel right there, isn't it? Like this child, we're helpless. We're held captive by sin, unable to free ourselves or to create a new life from this thing that kills us. Sin and death have dominion over our lives. And there is nothing we can do to change the situation. But Jesus saves us. He gives us a new life and he sets us free. If you're not saved this morning, That's what Jesus is offering you. He's offering you a new life. He's reaching out his hand to you. He doesn't condemn you. He's not disappointed in you. He longs for you to have life just like this father longed for his son to have new life. He cares for you more than this father cares for his son. And just like this father, he pleads for life for you. He pleads with you, the Bible says, to be reconciled to him. God is not indifferent about your salvation. He doesn't say, hey, look, I did the thing on the cross. You take it or leave it. I could care less. The Bible says that all day long, he stretches out his hands towards us. Paul says, on behalf of God, we plead with you, be reconciled to God. If you're not saved this morning, God has you here to hear his heart for you. He longs for you to have life and to be free from the sentence of death that sin brings over us. And all you have to do is respond, to reach out and accept the hand that has been reached out towards you. Accept his salvation this morning and find the life eternal and abundant in him. The family at the center of our story as we go back to Luke certainly has new life, don't they? What a celebration. But the disciples were confused by this. As this story kind of unfolds, as the father and son go their way, they're confused by this. Mark's gospel adds a little exchange. It says when they had come into the house, when they were together privately, his disciples asked him, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. It's kind of an odd exchange, isn't it, right? And it can seem a bit confusing. But when we stop and look at the whole story, I think Jesus' response to his disciples is actually pretty simple. Let's roll back the tape, if you will. The story goes something like this. A father and his son have come looking for Jesus and or his disciples. They need help. 
Jesus isn't there. So the disciples who've been given authority over the demonic pray for the child. But this time, the demon doesn't leave. And it seems that the disciples have failed. And when Jesus comes down from the mountain, he finds the disciples arguing with the scribes. Their attention isn't on the child any longer. They're caught up in a debate. And as Jesus surveys the situation, he grieves and comments over the lack of faith that he's found. So what does all this have to do with Jesus' answer as to why couldn't we throw out this demon? Why couldn't we cast it out? Why does Jesus answer this way? Now, I've heard it taught that Jesus is saying that we should have a lifestyle of prayer and fasting so that when we run into a particularly difficult situation or find some stiff opposition, we're prepared for that moment. And while I think fasting is a healthy and good rhythm for Christians, I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here in this moment. Rather, I think what Jesus is telling his disciples is this, keep fighting. Don't give up. Never give in. Don't lose faith, guys. Double down and do hard work. In this case, with this child, in this situation, that would have meant continuing in prayer, wouldn't it? Until the boy was free. It would have meant perhaps skipping meals and beginning to fast, a way of intensifying and focusing our prayers. But the disciples haven't done those things, have they? Because what are they doing when Jesus finds them? He comes down the mountain, and are they still gathered around the boy? Are they still petitioning their heavenly Father? Were they persisting in prayer? Had they skipped meals to continue in prayer? No, not at all. They're now arguing with the scribes. They weren't fighting spiritual battles any longer on behalf of those in need. They're squabbling with naysayers and nitpickers. And I think this is the lesson Jesus is trying to teach us. Keep fighting. Disciples, you guys tried. Maybe you threw a few punches, but when you got punched back, you gave up. Keep fighting. And the same is true for us. Keep going. Don't give up. Never give in. The battles we encounter as we follow Jesus, they're not always easy and quick. Again, here that meant continuing in prayer for this boy, but what does that look like for you? Are there spiritual battles going on in your life that you need to continue in, to persist in? Are there spiritual battles that perhaps you've given up on? And I don't ask that to condemn or to heap guilt on you. And I'm certainly not asking as one who never fails. I've had a sad realization about myself. I mentioned it earlier. I want spiritual battles to be easy. I certainly want victory over sin. I want to walk in holiness, but I don't want it to take any effort on my part. I want to grow in wisdom, but my flesh doesn't want to spend any time in God's word. I want a fruitful life, but I don't want to get off the couch. I want all the good things that Jesus describes in an abundant life of walking with him, but I honestly, I don't want to do the work that it's needed to produce them in my life, to walk in the good things that God has prepared for me. What about you? Is there an issue of sin that perhaps God has identified and you agree that it needs to go, but like me, you're just hoping one day you'll wake up and it'll be gone? That one morning you'll wake up victorious, no longer struggling with that thing. Now, we might not say it like that. We might just be kidding around at that point. We don't expect to simply wake up and be victorious. But sometimes we live like it, right? I'm just hoping that I'll get over this thing. I'm just hoping that my life will change. We're not actually fighting against the things that are fighting against us. Like the disciples, we tried we got some pushback, and so we walked away from the fight. We're not doing the things anymore. Again, sometimes the battles that we face need more than one push forward. Sometimes it's not a one-punch knockout. It's a 12-round fight. This type of victory, Jesus says, it comes through prayer and fasting. Keep going. 
Keep fighting, he says. For us, it might include fasting. This type of victory that we want to see in our life, it comes through prayer and bringing in a friend into our lives. It comes through prayer and perhaps seeking out some counseling to talk through some stuff. It comes through prayer and changing things in our lives. It comes through prayer and humbling ourselves. It comes through uh, prayer and facing our fears. It comes through prayer and asking for help. It certainly doesn't come by giving up. Never give in in the battles that God has called you to fight. And we can even see this And what Jesus says next, as we're back in Luke chapter 9, as people were still marveling over the majesty of what they've seen God do through his life, Jesus says, let these words sink down into your ears, verse 44, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand the saying, and it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. God's power was being displayed in amazing ways through the life of Jesus. God was undeniably at work. And it's against this uh, backdrop of this elation and these victories that Jesus reminds his disciples about his upcoming betrayal. Matthew and Mark both expand on this statement to say that it included his death, burial, and resurrection. Mark 9, verse 31, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he was killed, he will rise the third day. Now, this is not the only thing happening here as Jesus is talking to his disciples. I don't mean to say this is the only thing he's trying to teach them. But in connection to the lesson that we've been chewing on this morning, he is telling them life isn't always up and to the right. It's not always awesome and awesomer the next day. It's a battle. And if it was a battle for Jesus, it shouldn't be any different for his disciples. There are difficult battles as we follow the plans that God has for us. And these battles, they're battles. They're not easy. Again, for Jesus here, that meant heartbreaking betrayal and a gruesome death. Obedience wasn't going to be easy for him or convenient. Remember what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before this betrayal or the night of his betrayal? He said, Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. Difficult obedience. I'd rather not go through with this if there's any other way. Now, thankfully for us, he kept fighting, didn't he? Instead of quitting, getting up and leaving the garden, Jesus followed through in obedience. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He kept fighting. As we close this morning, I don't mean to imply in any way that this is easy. That's one of the things we've been saying over and over again. It's a battle. It's not easy. But I do want to encourage any of us who consciously or unconsciously are operating under the assumption that things should always be easy. That life is meant to just be up and to the right. It's meant to just be easy as we follow Jesus. Isn't that what I signed up for? It's not. It's not what you signed up for. So keep fighting. Dig in for the fight. Never give up. The change that God wants to bring in your life, it doesn't come without a fight. Like this father and his son, the season that you're in or the struggles that you're working through, they're going to take more than other seasons and other struggles. Sometimes a season is a beautiful, life-giving season, and sometimes a struggle is resolved quickly. But that's not always the case, is it? Sometimes a struggle is a 12-round battle. It's a heavyweight fight. And you take as many punches as you give. Never give up. Keep fighting. Don't get distracted in the fight against sin or the fight to persist in obedience. For some of us, you just need to hear that exhortation and that encouragement, keep fighting. And for others here in the room, you already get that. You've been fighting your battle for a long time. You've fought. You've fasted. You've prayed a hundred times over. 
And I just want to say with as much compassion as I can muster, don't give up. Your struggle hasn't gone unnoticed. You're not unseen. Joseph was in an Egyptian prison for years before being elevated and rescued. Hannah prayed for years before receiving the son that she longed for. David ran from Saul for years before that situation was resolved and he took the throne. And you know what? Sometimes a battle isn't won until we reach heaven. Listen to how in Hebrews 11 it describes those who kept fighting until the finish line of heaven. After a chapter full of wonderful acts of faith, it says others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. I'd like to tell you that tomorrow the fight wraps up and you emerge victorious and everything begins to just be sweet and life-giving. But sometimes the finish line for us is heaven. Sometimes the battle keeps going until we see Jesus face to face. And that's a hard reality to embrace. I'm not here to say that that's easy. But I am here to say that you can keep going. That God hasn't asked you to carry a weight that he isn't intending to carry with you. Take my yoke upon you, he says. And we, he wears that yoke with us. I don't know what weight you're carrying this morning, what battle you might be facing, but you're not facing it alone. And so keep fighting. Keep digging in. Never give up. I don't know how long you'll need to keep fighting, but I know a minute, not a minute goes unseen. So I want to encourage you, by God's grace, keep going this morning. As we wrap up and pray, as we close in worship, there's going to be people on either side of the room who would love to pray with you. Whether you're in a short season of difficulty or it's a protracted season that has defined your life for years, if you need prayer to keep going this morning, come up and get prayer. Or just tap the person on the shoulder next to you and say, look, I could really use some prayer this morning. This has been a heavy weight for a long time, and I feel like I'm going to collapse here any minute. Get some folks to pray for you. Find some help. Get some people who have compassion on you and can see you and can be an extension of God's care and love for you. Let's close in prayer this morning. Father, if the words of Winston Churchill stirred and motivated his people, how much more your care for us and the fact that you promise to never leave us or forsake us. And that you say sometimes, hey, this one doesn't come out this battle's not fought, uh, finished or fought without much prayer and fasting. Lord, you see us and you know us. And sometimes that in and of itself makes the fight something that we can continue doing, something that we can continue engaging with, just the knowledge that we're not unseen. Lord, I want to pray for those this morning who are going through great difficulty. That you would encourage them and speak hope to their soul. And they say like that, Father, Lord, I believe you're able, but I know I'm mixed through with doubt and fear. Help our unbelief. And Lord, for those of us in the room who feel like a victory over sin should just be easy, would you give us some steel in our spines? a bit of holy aggression that we won't be passive towards sin, we won't be indifferent towards a pursuit of holiness? Would we be people who pursue this and pursue you, Lord?
Help us not think sin is just a small thing in our life that it really doesn't matter. It's not really going to do anything. Lord, will we be a people who pursue you diligently, passionately, never giving up, never giving in. 